Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Christian Fishers of Men podcast. I am your host, Alan. I'm coming at you again. Forgive me for not posting last week. We've had sickness running through the house. My little girl, my youngest, she got hit really hard, and uh, it seems like it's it's getting one of my other kids, and, and uh, I felt a little bit down myself, although it hasn't hit me as hard, so... We got a little bit of sickness running through the house, so forgive me for not posting last week, but uh, sometimes you just gotta, you gotta stop and catch your breath for a minute. Um, We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna tackle uh, Elder Uchtdorf, the uh, second talk of General Conference, going through our our General Conference uh, series here, I guess you could say. Um... Really good stuff in here. I'm just going to go ahead and get into it, and then I'm going to also be posting just kind of uh, some stuff on my heart as well in in a separate podcast that I'll be uploading as well, so you can check that out if, if you'd like. But of course, uh, all, as always, my admonition to you would be to listen to the words of the brethren first and foremost before you do anything. And take notes. Don't just don't don't just listen. If if you're able, right? If you're able, carve out some time and take some notes on what these guys are saying. And then let's compare our notes, right? Because this is this is a huge focus of what I want to do here. Every once in a while, I'm going to post something that's just on my heart. But the main purpose is for us to number one, Let's listen to what the brethren are saying. That's that's first and foremost the goal of this podcast is to to get those of us who might be struggling, who might be on the fence about the church and stuff like that. Let's let's get back to Christ's foundation and ultimately back to Christ Himself. Right? Let's get back to that. Let's get back to the foundation and let's start listening to what the brethren are saying. Let's start let's start heeding their admonitions and let's. Um, not just listen, but let's go ahead and let's take notes, and then let's compare notes. Let's see what you wrote down. Let's you know write it down in the comment section if you'd like. I mean, if if you're into that, either way, you know what I'm saying. I I write down my notes. I share them with you guys in hopes that you are taking notes and that you're you're comparing. And then you know what I mean. If we can if we can kind of get into that habit then I think that it will be nothing but beneficial for everybody, uh, myself included. I, I love doing this. I love having an excuse to be able to talk about the gospel. And I love being able to reach out through the internet and to touch you know, the, the lives of, of people, and hopefully we're all able to be edified together with the Spirit, no matter what country we're in, no matter where you are. So... Let's go ahead and get into this. The thing that I like about this is is right in the title, Jesus Christ is the strength of youth. So often, it's been a common tactic, especially the last three years, three to five, but really the last three, has been, um, especially with the ex-Mormon, to accuse us, those of us who are holding on to the iron rod and who, no matter what is asked of us, right, when the prophet uh, says jump or when the apostles give us admonitions, we say okay and we, we jump. You know what I mean? We, we, we do what we're asked to do because we know not that the men are perfect, not that the men are these incredible, you know, superhero type people, but because we know the power and the personage, the God, who stands behind them and who gives them inspiration, revelation, who gives them the messages that they are to then relay to us. This is not something that was a man's idea, mind you. This is not a blueprint that is the idea of any person this is, well, in a way it is, but any mortal person, I should say. This blueprint that we read about in the New Testament, as well as in the Book of Mormon, is a blueprint that was uh, from the, the gospel of Christ and from the doctrine of Christ, 
from the words of Christ, right? This is his church. He is the architect. It is his blueprint that we are carrying out here, right? The foundation is his idea. It is his idea to build it on a foundation of prophets and apostles, with himself being the chief cornerstone. So, it's been a, a tactic of, of the ex-Mormon to, as well as the non-believer, right? The Babylonian, I guess you could say. Those who, uh, who do not want the message to get out. Those who may be allied with the enemy or who are un, uh, unwitting allies with the enemy. They will say that we are prophet worshippers, that we are uh, I idolatrous in that we hold up the prophet in such high esteem and we hold his counsel as if it was coming from Christ himself and we put him above Christ, which is the furthest thing from the truth. And I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, look at what they're saying, listen to what they're saying, listen to what the brethren are talking about. In every talk you will see them pointing us back to Christ. If you, are tr if you have ears to hear, if you're truly listening, and you don't have an agenda, you will see that. You will find that. And it's plain as day throughout this talk as well. Getting into it. In preparation for this message today, I have felt strong promptings to address the young women and young men. I am also speaking to those who used to be young, even to those who can't really remember it anymore. <laughs> And I speak to all who love our young people and want them to succeed in life. Okay? He's talking to everybody, right? Elder Uchtdorf is addressing us all. So everybody needs to pay attention to this. And I highlighted this next sentence. For the rising generation, I have a message especially for you from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pause. Brothers and sisters, is this a sentence that you would pass by, that you would just kind of casually read over? It's a gut check moment here. This is something I have been hitting hard on myself the last six months to a year. Um, probably more so the last six months, where I have, I've done a gut check and I didn't like what I saw. You know what I mean? I would have other YouTubers point things out that I completely missed in talks. And I said, how did I miss that? That's huge. These little sentences that we can, as we're reading, they might seem like little throwaway comments and stuff. This is not one of those situations, brothers and sisters. I'm going to read that one more time. For the rising generation, I have a message especially for you from our Savior Jesus Christ. That carries some serious weight and authority. And it is not that Elder Uchtdorf is Captain America, right? Or Captain Germany, whatever, right? He's not, he's not Iron Man. He's not the Incredible Hulk. It is the power that is endorsing him that I reverence, and the God that stands behind him that I reverence. And when he gives a message through one of his servants, through one of his humble servants, who is a man just like me, I take note, and my ears perk up, and yours should as well. And look out for this in the future. Don't let this, this stuff pass by, you guys. This is important information. And it's just like President Nelson says, if we are to survive spiritually, we need to pick up on this stuff, okay? Moving on. The Savior's message to you. My dear friends, my dear young friends, if the Savior were here right now, what would he say to you? Okay, let, think about what I just said. I believe he would start by expressing his deep love for you. He might say it with words. But it would also flow so strongly just from his presence that it would be unmistakable, reaching deep into your heart, filling your whole soul. In my notes, I wrote, Hmm. <laughs> I wrote, Hmm. This strikes me as something that was learned from experience. I wouldn't think someone would just come up with that without having felt that before. 
Just a thought. Okay? The idea that I'm trying to communicate there, brothers and sisters, is that when we read these things, if we're, if we're in tune, you're going to pick up on stuff like that and you're going to say, why is he wording it that way? Why is he saying it that way? Why am I feeling this way when he says that? I think it is exactly that. I think that he's speaking from experience. You can take that however you'd like. But uh, I think he literally is speaking from experience. Okay, moving on. And yet because we're all weak and imperfect, some concerns might creep into your mind. You might remember mistakes you've made, times you gave in to temptation, things you wish you hadn't done or wish you had done better. Boy, he hits that on the head, doesn't he? It was interesting when I read that. Because I have thought that my entire life. doesn't matter if I was nine years old, 19, 25, right now. You know what I'm saying? Those things, when I enter into the presence of the great Jehovah, I think that's just a natural uh, inclination of those of us who dwell in mortality to look back on our past and to cringe a little bit as we stand in the awesome majesty that is the Savior and Redeemer of the human race. He who did not sin yet took upon our sins and bled from every pore. I, I, I think that's very natural for us to think that. Uh, the Savior would sense that, and I believe He would assure you with words He has spoken in the Scriptures, Fear not. Doubt not. Be of good cheer. Let not your heart be troubled. I don't think He would make excuses for your mistakes. He wouldn't minimize them. No, He would ask you to repent, to leave your sins behind, to change, so He can forgive you. This is powerful stuff, guys. This really is powerful stuff. Uh, I highlighted this next part. He would remind you that 2,000 years ago, He took those sins upon Himself so that you could repent. That is part of the plan of happiness gifted to us from our loving Heavenly Father. Made a note here. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. First uh, Nephi 10.6 Wherefore all mankind were in a lost and in a fallen state, and ever would be, save they, sh they should rely on this Redeemer. I, I, th this is the part where we really should be lockstep in line with our uh, fellow Christian, our Protestants, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, it's one of those things that I think that they bring up as a point of, of difference between us, but there's not any difference between us. It, they are 100% right. We are saved by grace. There is literally no works that we can do to accomplish our own salvation. That's 100% accurate. They're, they're, they are spot on. We, and we are absolutely in agreement with that. There is nothing that we can do of ourselves to obtain forgiveness in this world just from our own works, right? From anything that we can do. We can't make it. We get up there on that, on that, uh, uh, on on the you know on the, the the bar to go bench press 400 pounds but yet you're only capable of 160 right there's no possible way that when you get that bar up in the air and you go to press that sucker that you're going to be able to get it up there's no possible way right it takes Christ coming in as the spotter right and helping us to get that weight off of our chest and up into the air. And with His help, 
and only with His help, do we obtain a remission of sins. Do we obtain? Do we obtain through His grace, as our 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 uh, our, our spotter, right? <laughs> As we obtain that grace, He helps us to get that weight, those sins, off of our, our chest and enables us to return into the presence of our Heavenly Father. 110%. And because of the atonement, we have that opportunity to accept Him as our, our spotter, right? Sorry, you guys know me. I'm a, that, that's my worldview. I'm, I'm going to use some weightlifting analogies and stuff like that. It's one of those things. I, I, I think the difference comes in with us and our Protestant brothers and sisters, and I wish it didn't, because this is a time when we need to be uh, looking at the things that make us similar, the things we have in common. We can argue theology. I can argue theology with another member of, of my faith for the rest of my life. We will have differences, things that we interpret differently. That's just the way it is. That's very much our mortal experience, right? I would never tell a Protestant person that they are following a a false Jesus Christ or that they are following a Jesus Christ who doesn't exist. And, and I would hope that... I've had it done to me, of course, but you know, I, I hope that in the future we can get past that crap because... We need each other. We do. We really do need each other. We need to band together as Christians, as f fellow believers in Christ. And we need to lock arms and work together. We really do, 110%. Um, moving on. I could talk about that. I could make a whole podcast about that, but I've, I've got to move along here. Jesus might point out that your covenants with him, made when you were baptized and renewed each time you partake of the sacrament, give you a special connection with him. The kind of connection the scripture describe as being yoked together so that with his help you can carry any burden. And when you put on that yoke, brothers and sisters, we, we are like the sickly, the, the sickly skinny ox in that scenario, and Christ is the big beefy one who is... He's really doing all the work. <laughs> he just asks that we do these couple of things. Hey, get baptized just like I got baptized, right? Partake of my sacrament every week. You know what I'm saying? Make these covenants. Um, carrying on here. I believe the Savior Jesus Christ would want you to see, feel, and know that He is your strength. That with His help, there are no limits to what you can accomplish. That your potential is limitless. He would want you to see yourself the way he sees you, and that is very different from the way the world sees you. Um, let me read this, this last sentence, and then I'm going to go to my note. The Savior would declare in no uncertain terms that you are a daughter or son of the Almighty God. I have in my notes a quote from C.S. Lewis that I wanted to share because it just it sprang into my mind when I was reading this. And this has been quoted by many a prophet and apostle. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumcision proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. Huh. Huh. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, but their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. 
but it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. C.S. Lewis, The Weight of Glory. Wow, that, I mean, that's incredible. That is incredible. That really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Um, I got a couple of scriptures here, and then we can we can kind of break it down a little bit more. Psalm eighty two six, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Romans eight fourteen through seventeen, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. I think that we, and it is a common tactic of the adversary, to Make sure that we do not remember that. If we were to, as the scriptures admonish us and give us that vital bits of information there, and as C.S. Lewis puts it, if we were to remember that every single person that you talk to not just has worth, but has the absolute most incredibly a precious worth. How would that change the world? What problems would solve themselves if we remembered that? I'm reminded of, of a thought. I imagine that what actual hell is, is making it to the next world to be judged of our Maker, to stand in front of our Heavenly Father, to have Christ there as our advocate with the Father, to have those who have been prophets and apostles present, who have delivered messages to us from Christ, as they are washing their hands of our blood and speaking as to if they indeed delivered the messages that they were asked to deliver to us. Can you imagine getting to that point, having the veil of forgetfulness, forgetfulness taken from your mind, remembering everything, the eons of existence that you had before in the pre-existence, the war in heaven, where you very extremely likely raised your voice in support of the Messiah, of the atonement, of that time-honored plan that has always been in existence. And then to have the deeds of 50 to 70 years of mortality when you snubbed those those who you walked amongst, who are, who did listen, and who are receiving their exaltation, and you see the glory that they are inheriting from their Father in heaven. These are powerful, powerful images, very powerful, powerful thoughts and thought experiments because they are real. That is 100% accurate. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that I don't have to be the one to judge because I have made more mistakes than I can count. There, I've been such an idiot at times in my life, especially in my youth. Man, I was a hard-headed kid. I was. I, 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 I'm sure I hurt a lot of people. You know, and... The older I've gotten, the you know, 
I, I think that we that that story is all of us. I think that is the the mortal story. We look back and we we remember these horrible things that we've done, the sins that we made against our God, right? Times when we didn't hold the hold the um, the gospel of Jesus Christ as as the, our foremost, you know, mission here on earth, where we were selfish, where we lost our way, where we let go of the iron rod, where we hurt others, where we were terrible examples to non-believers, whatever the case may be, to your kids, whatever, you know. I'm so grateful for the atonement of Christ. I, I'm so grateful that He provided a way for somebody like me to, to come back, to wash away my sins through His blood. I'm so grateful for that, that I can go to the other side, that those things can be remembered no more. And that he can he can show me, you know, my true self. That these these thoughts that creep into our mind about ourselves, that as we are trying, as we are living the gospel, as we repent daily and partake of the sacrament, that he will allow us to inherit all that the Father hath. He will enable us through that adoption that it speaks about. By the way that Christ becomes the Father and the Son in that moment, right? He adopts us as His own. And I love that. that it's, it's just so incredible, and it, we need to stop, and we need to think about that more often. Um, your Heavenly Father is the most glorious being in the universe, full of love, joy, purity, holiness, light, grace, and truth. And one day... He wants you to inherit all He has. In my notes here, I, I wrote down beautiful doctrine. One of the things that um, Joseph Smith, you can just feel it. You, you can just feel it, brothers and sisters. One of the things that he talked about was that this gospel of Jesus Christ, when you start getting into it, when you start to consume it, to study it. When you get into it, it becomes, as Joseph Smith would say, said, it's, it becomes delicious. This doctrine is delicious. It tastes good. And this doctrine, brothers and sisters, it tastes good. It's awesome. Uh, 1 John 3, 1 through 2, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Acts 17.28 For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's... I love the fact now now think let, let's let's pause here. This doctrine is delicious, yes. Let's pause, let's let's zoom out. Why is Elder Uchtdorf telling our youth and us this? More specifically, he's the rising generation. Think about that. We have to ask ourselves that question with everything that we are taught. Why? Why are they telling us this? It's an interesting thought experiment to have, brothers and sisters, and it's something that's important for us to do. I'm going to step back, and I'm going to tell you Alan's thoughts here. So 
separate Alan's thoughts from Elder Uchtdorf here for a second. I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't believe the Savior is very far away. I don't believe we have a long time to wait before the Messiah returns. I would not be surprised if the meetings of Adam on Diamond, and just as a side note, uh, Bruce R. McConkie, he wrote that it very well could be that there are multiple uh, conferences in that epic, legendary meeting, right? That it may be a multi-conference uh, event instead of just a showing up for for brunch and and you know crowning Christ King, that it would be you know one of those things that would be a, a conference type of deal where they would do it over multiple sessions. Going back to the task at hand. I don't think that that is far away. Which is why we need to pay attention to what the brethren are saying and compare it to what they have said in the past. That is why I feel the way I do. There is a hastening of the work. That cannot be denied. That is a fact. There is a changing in phraseology from the, the prophets, from prophet to prophet, right? From time to time. They are saying things now that can really only be interpreted in one way. They are telling us, you are the generation. I bring it up all the time, but President Nelson brings up, you know, two, two years ago or whatever, to, to the, 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 the women of the church, that they, their daughters and their granddaughters, will be the ones to welcome the city of Enoch. President Nelson tells us in general conference that we are the people that Nephi saw in vision. Brothers and sisters, the bridegroom cometh. I just want to impress that upon your minds. I, I just, I don't think we have much longer. Going back to the task at hand here. All right, getting getting back onto the road to to Damascus here. Uh, and one day he wants you to inherit all he has. It is the reason why you're why you're on the earth to learn, grow, and progress and become everything your Father in Heaven has created you for. To make this possible, He sent Jesus Christ to be your Savior. It's the purpose behind His great plan of happiness, His church, His priesthood, the Scriptures, all of it. This is your destiny. That is your future. That is your choice. It's all about choice. It always is about choice, isn't it? If that doesn't give you a sense of your worth in the eyes of the greatest being in the universe, in our existence, nothing will. He cared about you and I so much that instead of having us cast off, counting his losses, right? He sends His perfect, most precious, sinless Son to atone for us so that we could return. That's, that really, it's incredible. There is so much about the atonement that we don't understand. But what we do understand is grace doesn't even begin to cover it. Mercy and grace those words are inadequate to describe the power and the worth and the feelings, I think, that our, our Heavenly Father, our God, has towards us. 
Moving on, uh, Truth and Choices. At the heart of God's plan for your happiness is your power to choose. Of course, your Heavenly Father wants you to choose eternal joy with Him, and He will help you to achieve it, but He would never force it upon you. So He allows you to choose light or darkness, good or evil, joy or misery, eternal life or spiritual death. Kimber, come bear your testimony real quick. My daughter just snuck in here. Come bear your testimony real quick. The world wants to hear from you. Just bear your testimony. Jesus loves me. You gotta say it loud. Jesus loves you. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good night. Love you. All right, that was my daughter. I had to embarrass her a little bit. Of course, your Heavenly Father wants you to choose eternal joy with Him, and He will help you to achieve it. But He would never force it upon you. So He allows you to choose light or darkness, good or evil, joy or misery, eternal life or spiritual death. It sounds like an easy choice, doesn't it? I highlighted this part. But somehow here on earth, it seems more complicated than it ought to be. Okay, I made a note. Satan's job to complicate things. Dot, dot, dot. Think of the tree of life and the rod of iron. It's a simple enough task. But if you leave the rod, you will lose your ability to see clearly as the mist sets in on you. I love that the, the allegory, the allegorical dream, the vision that Lehi had and that Nephi had following Lehi. And that the picture that it paints for us, because that is a, the gospel is a straight path, and it's very straightforward. It's not difficult, it's not hard. Your task is to hold on to the iron rod, to put your head down as the wind blows, as the temptations around you are, are raging. And to simply, you don't even have to see. You can close your eyes and you can follow that iron rod all the way. But so many people let go. So many people let go because... Take you, pick your reason. And it's so sad... Brothers and sisters, I, I do this because I don't want to sit idly by as my brothers and sisters are spiritually dying to the left and right of me. I feel like I have to do something. I'm a regular guy. I'm a very regular dude. I consider myself nothing special. I'm an average Joe. But something that I'm starting to recognize is that having a testimony and actually believing, not just having this as a culture, but actually believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ and having that testimony, that it, it becomes a duty to raise my voice in support of the Savior, of the gospel, and, and to just to bear my testimony, to share my insights as I study with my fellow brothers and sisters who dwell on this earth with me. Like that, that is becoming a superpower. It really is. It's becoming a superpower. We are watching people spiritually die left and right, and it's hard to watch. You know, oh, 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 ye, my fair ones. You know, the, the words of Mormon as he talks about his people. Oh, ye, fair ones. It, it's, it's almost even hard to put into words, isn't it? This whole choice thing.
I, I listen to people who are on YouTube, fellow YouTubers who have much larger followings than I do. And many of them, some of the guys that I have listened to have been people who have left our faith, and they give their reasons as to why they leave our faith. And there's a common theme. There really, there's a common theme. As the world has changed and become more accepting in the name of tolerance of sin, and as the church has not uh, changed its stance, as it has done as it always has, expressed nothing but love, but we, we, we can't change the ordinances, we can't change, no, we, we, we just can't change these things. It's, it's not going to happen. You know, th those, those are predominantly the reasons why people are leaving. And it's sad, because we have allowed the culture of the world to override the culture of the church. And if you don't have a testimony, if you don't know that this is true, and you've been relying on this as a culture, it's not enough. It's, it's not enough. It's not going to work. And you will then be presented with a choice. And we are seeing many of our brothers and sisters choose spiritual death. Sad. Very sad. Continuing on. The problem is that we don't always see things as clearly as we would like to. The Apostle Paul compared it to looking through a glass darkly. Pause. In the New Testament, in the Greek, whenever you see the word glass, you can substitute that for mirror. It's translated the same, okay? So look, try looking at a mirror darkly, okay? You can't... Have you ever tried to do your hair? I don't have any hair on my head anymore, but I, I have a beard that I, that I comb, and on Sunday I put beer balm in it, and I put some uh, beard oil, and I give it a nice little comb and stuff like that, try to make it look nice and, and sharp, right? You ever tried to get yourself ready, tie a tie, whatever, in like a glass after it's been... after you've showered and you can't see anything? How useful is that glass? That mirror, right? Not very useful. Extremely difficult. There's a lot of confusion in the world about what is right and what, and what is wrong. Truth gets twisted to make evil seem good and good seem evil. I highlighted that part. But when you earnestly seek the truth, okay, I highlighted that part, when you earnestly seek the truth, Eternal, unchanging truth, your choices become much clearer. Yes, you still have temptation and trials. Bad things will still happen. Puzzling things. Tragic things. But you can manage when you know who you are, why you are here, and when you trust God. How true is that? You know... I have often looked at things that have happened in my immediate family. Things that, you know, in my wife's uh, background, things that happened to her as a child that are just so unfair. Things that happened to my friends and, and their children, you know, things that have happened to sicknesses that my children have, diseases and stuff like that, you know conditions, medical conditions, these things, I can't imagine facing them without having, having a God that I know loves and cares about me and un having an understanding as to why mortality is supposed to be a challenge, why it can't be easy. And knowing that no matter what happens, especially in this day and age, in this moment in history, that if something were to happen, if I were to lose a loved one, or if I were to myself pass on through that through that doorway into uh, leaving mortality, that it would not be long before I saw my loved ones again, and that there would be loved ones, family members on the other side who would be waiting to receive me. 
That is the view that we need to have. And that is the hope of Israel. That really is. That, that is the hope of Israel. That is the, the doctrine of Christ right there. It's beautiful. It really is beautiful. I gotta hurry and get through this. I'm not even halfway. I'm blabbing a lot, but I guess that's what it's all about, huh? I hope I hope you're comparing notes, guys. Um, so where do you find truth? It is contained in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the fullness of the gospel is taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. I highlighted that and I made a note. Why do we say this? I wrote that down. Why do we say this? Some attack this phrase as one meaning that we are somehow better than others. This is not the case. We have a prophet that helps us interpret scripture and clarifies doctrine. We can look at the Bible with confidence now, as the doctrine has been restored and our views on it help us sift through it. Again, you know, we, we look at... We look at our brothers and sisters of, of different religions, and I, there is immediately an ire that, that people have when we say, yeah, we have the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. It does. Anybody who has the Bible has access to a window to the fullness of the gospel of Christ. It's there. The doctrine is there. However, as we see evidenced by the many different religions out there, you can interpret things wildly different. I recently had some attacks on this channel, some comments uh, by some people who, who attack the, the fact that we have a prophet and stuff like that. And I can't help but laugh at these comments. It's like, dude, would you be saying this if in the past if Moses was up there? Yeah, you would. You would be that guy who would be, you know, talking talking smack on Moses as he's trying to get us out of out of Egypt and stuff like that. You'd probably be the guy who was, you know, with the group that got swallowed up by the earth because you rebelled against Moses and against Jehovah. We have the prophet here. We have the authority to act in God's name. We have apostles. We have the foundation. We have a prophet who can interpret scripture, who can tell us the true meaning of this stuff. Go back into the Doctrine and Covenants and look at what Joseph Smith talked about on the book of Revelations. About Matthew, about all, I mean, all the Joseph Smith translations and stuff like that. They clarify things to an incredible degree. It's, it is, it's amazing to me. I can't imagine not having a prophet. And this, this is stuff that our ancestors recognized was missing. They knew it was missing. It's the whole reason why you had the Protestant movement in the first place. I love the Protestant reformers. I do. Now, there's some guys that had some problems. Absolutely. There, there isn't any organization, right? But you can look back on these guys, and you can look at them as children of their age, and you can see, I mean, Martin Luther, you know, John Wycliffe, uh, William Tyndale. There are so many incredible men that recognized that the organization on the earth at that time was corrupt, was not following what was in the good book, the Bible, right? It was, it was nowhere near that. There were just incredible, incredible people. It, when you go to uh, uh, Fox's Book of the Martyrs, I recently got that. You can find that online for free. You guys should look at that and read some of those stories and those people. There was, um, there was a lady in there who was royalty, a, a princess, I believe. 
And she, uh, one of the things that she was saying was like, guys, this isn't in the Bible. Show me what verse, if you could. She challenged one of the clergymen. She's like, okay, you're saying that. That's great. Show me where. W where do you have the authority to say that? Where is the, the verse? Where's the book? Show me in the Bible where, where it says that, right? Wasn't there. If you go back to about 100 A.D., you will read words of the Christians at that time who had been trained, some of them, by people who either were apostles or who were trained by the apostles. And they recognized that the authority was missing. It was gone. And so what do you get? You get a situation like what the Protestants were fleeing. That's what That was the... That was the... That was the infant stage of what blossomed into what caused a Protestant need, a need for a Protestant Reformation. It's incredible. I could do a whole podcast on that. I know. I'm getting long-winded here on some of these points, but it's just stuff that's on my heart as well. It is a bold claim, but there is a reason why we say it. And it is not saying that you that anybody else is a moron or anything like that that's not what we're saying we're we're boldly stating that we have the same organization that the primitive church had when Christ was on the earth the one that he organized all right moving on Jesus Christ said I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me when you have important choices to make, Jesus Christ and his restored gospel are the best choice. When you have been question, when you have questions, Jesus Christ and his restored gospel are the best answer. When you feel weak, Jesus Christ is your strength. I highlighted that and I made a note. Uh, I said perfect example of the foundation. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19-21 through 21. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. I... I'll share something with you guys. I've been praying to know Christ better. I've been praying to have a more personal relationship with my with my Savior. I've been asking for that. I've been seeking that. And the answer and the way that the Lord has answered that prayer uh, was surprising to me. As I have gone and as I have served others, as I have uh, brought sacrament to the homebound, as I, I, I went and I, I uh, helped teach the uh, in the old folks' home last Sunday, you know, I subbed for, for somebody. Every time I have done that, I have felt like I have just gotten a little closer, like I've caught in a glimpse, like I have felt the presence of the Savior. And it's been incredible to me, because I should have known that. It shouldn't be surprising to me, but it was. That the way for me to more, more fully and to bring myself closer into alignment, to have a personal relationship with my Savior, is to serve my, my brothers and sisters. Very cool stuff. And I would, I would encourage any of you that if you're feeling in that same way, if you're feeling like, like you're maybe lacking with your relationship with your Savior, get out there and start serving your brothers and sisters. And I promise you, your relationship with the Savior will grow 110%. He gives power to the weary and to those who feel powerless. He increases strength. 
They who wait upon the Lord will be renewed by His strength. Now that's a promise. That's a promise. This isn't a thing saying, maybe you might uh, be renewed by His strength. He's saying, they who wait upon the Lord will be renewed by His strength. Okay. That is, that is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. Uh, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increased strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That is a promise. And I would treat it as such. Uh, the next section, for the strength of youth. To help you find your way and to help you make Christ's doctrine the guiding influence in your life. I highlighted that. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has prepared a new resource, a revised version of For the Strength of Youth. For over 50 years, the strength of youth has been a guide for generations of Latter-day Saint youth. I always keep a copy in my pocket, and I share it with people who are curious about our standards. It has been updated and refreshed to better cope with the challenges and temptations of our day. I uh, highlighted that and I made a note. In my notes I wrote, Living, Breathing Church. This is why having a prophet and apostles is key. Challenges change as time goes on. You have to pivot and change the shield wall and change tactics from time to time as the battle wages on. That's kind of a callback to something I talked about in uh, in the podcast episode, Raise Your Shields High. Um, just briefly, there is a tactic that many, many um, civilizations use, many militaries used back in the day when it was uh, uh, iron and and blood, right? But the Romans, I think, were the ones that kind of put it on the map, and they call it a testudo formation, or a shield wall, right? Where it looks like a, a, like a, a turtle shell of shields and spears poking out sometimes, right? They could create a shield wall. And while the shield wall is awesome, if the shield wall never moved, if it never pivoted, then the enemy would could just get behind it. And that's how I view our church. Our church is a shield wall. And it is a living, breathing church that is able to pivot and to change tactics a little bit, right? We can change the direction of our shields. We can we can change up our formation. You know what I'm saying? Instead of being like a line of shields, we can kind of form up and go back to back and stuff like that. That has to be the case. Um as the adversary is introducing new tactics as he or you know bringing up some ancient ones that haven't been used in a while we are able to because we are a living breathing church we can we can pivot and we can we can um we can juke we can jive right we can we can get in there and we can battle actively uh, the new version of For the Strength of Youth is available online in 50 different languages and will also be available in print it will be a significant a significant help for making choices in your life. Please embrace it as your own and share it with your friends. This new version of For the Strength of Use is subtitled A Guide for Making Choices. There's, there's, that, there's that word again. There's that idea of making choices. To be very clear, the best guide you can possibly have for making choices is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the strength of youth. I highlighted that. So the purpose of For the Strength of Youth is to point you to Him. Pause. That is the purpose of the brethren, of the scriptures, of the gospel, words of the prophets, present, ancient, doesn't matter. The mission of the church is to point us back to the great Jehovah, Jesus Christ. Yehoshua Amashiach, right? right? 
Ben Elohim. That is the whole reason it exists, and these these this gospel exists is to point us back to Christ. That's the reason these apostles and prophets are sacrificing their lives, the last bit of their lives, the, the precious stuff, where they, you know, these guys don't get to rest a lot. They are active, they are busy. They are trying to get us to go and face our way and walk back to Christ, run back to Christ. It teaches you eternal truths of His restored gospel, truths about who you are, who He is, and what you can accomplish with His strength. It teaches you how to make righteous choices based on eternal truths. In my notes I said truths that were lost. These things were what Joseph Smith was seeking after when he was a youth of 14 himself. These are things, brothers and sisters, we have to remember. How many of these problems would take care of themselves if we could remember these things, these basic things that have been restored to us? It's also important to know what for the strength of the youth does not do. It doesn't make decisions for you. It doesn't give you a yes or no about every choice you might ever face. For the strength of youth focuses on the foundation for your choices. It focuses on values, principles, and doctrine instead of every specific behavior. Now that should bring something to your mind, brothers and sisters. That should bring something to your mind, because that is a gospel principle. That was uh, brought up by Joseph Smith. Something that Brother Joseph said, um, I teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. So his inspired sermon, I teach them correct principles, and, and they govern themselves, still applies. Said Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the April 1993 General Conference address, The Lord uses that pattern with us. It has been proposed by some of my fellow podcasters that perhaps the church's ability to address us in the future will be hampered, if not altogether withdrawn, because of political or whatever. War, strife, you name it, right? How important is it for us to be not only in tune with the Spirit, but to understand and have these principles taught to us so that we are, in fact, able to govern ourselves. This is important stuff. This is important stuff. The Lord, through His prophets, has always been guiding us in that direction. He is pleading with us to increase our spiritual capacity to receive revelation. He is inviting us to hear Him. He is calling us to follow Him in higher and holier ways. And we are learning in a similar way every week in Come Follow Me. Brothers and sisters, we are commanded to be one. I'm pausing for a second. We have been commanded to be one, right? Something I thought is that is really cool is that uh, Nephi, in, in the Book of Mormon, the one who was alive and prophesying right before Christ came, the one who was given the sealing power, uh, the Jehovah, the great Jehovah had so much faith in him that he said, look, I know that if I give you this sealing power, you're not going to use it in a way that is not going to be something I would agree with. So, um, I, I, I have informed, you know, uh, your reality that whatever you, you say, you know, if the heavens are to be shut up, then they will obey, obey you as if I had said it, right? That's really cool. Not just because of, of the fact that 
Nephi was able to wield that power, but because Nephi had arrived to a spiritual plane of where he was kind of in line, he was spiritually in tune enough to know what he should and should not do. Do you think if he presented at the time, would he get a tattoo? <laughs> right? So many people have talked, so many ex-Mormons have talked about that. Like, oh, it's okay to get a tattoo now, apparently. No, no, it's not. That is not even close to what's being said. What we are being admonished to do, brothers and sisters, is to step the heck up. To step up. To not have laws of Moses anymore, but to to be spiritually in tune, to be able to receive revelation. Once we all get to that point, and once, once the church is cleansed, once we are sifted and the chaff has, has blown away, I, I can't wait to see the unity the oneness that will exist in that moment. I cannot wait for that. And though it will be sad to see friends, family, sifted as chaff, and to see them blow away in the wind, you know what I mean? Like, it will also be incredible to see the oneness that will exist as the saints of Zion as followers, true disciples of Jesus Christ, as we go to redeem Zion, as we meet the city of Enoch. I mean, th guys, this is an incredible time to be alive. This is an incredible time to be alive. I suppose... The guide could give you long lists of clothes you shouldn't wear, words you shouldn't stay, say, and movies you shouldn't watch. But would that really be helpful in a global church? Would such an approach truly prepare you for a lifetime of Christ-like living? Joseph Smith said, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. There it is again. And King Benjamin told his people in the Book of Mormon, I cannot tell you. Or, I, yeah, I cannot tell you all the things whereby you may commit sin. For there are diverse ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them. King Benjamin went on to say, But this much I can tell you. Watch yourselves and your thoughts, and your words and your deeds, and observe the commandments of God, and continue in the faith of our Lord even unto the end of your lives. I love King Benjamin. He, I mean... That is awesome. That's perfect. That's all you should have to hear is that one paragraph right there. And it's like, okay, yeah, that pretty much covers everything. That's, that's pretty good. Is it wrong to have rules? Of course not. We all need them every day. But it is wrong to focus only on rules instead of focusing on the Savior. Ooh, that's a good one. I highlighted that one. I wrote a note on the side here that says, This happened with the Law of Moses. This is what the Jews were wrestling with. So much so that they did not recognize their Messiah when he came to them the first time. That's, oh, I, could, I could almost do a podcast on that. There's a lot of material with the Gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't there? There's some good stuff there, meaty stuff. Um... But think about that, brothers and sisters. Think about that. Focusing so much on that stuff, and not only focusing on it, but getting pious and getting prideful about it, right? It's like the guy that wants to be bishop or stake president. You know that, that guy on your mission that used to uh, aspire to be an AP? Those are the type of people you got to watch out for. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure that there's some great people there. I, just, I had to get that dig in. Anybody that truly knows what's involved in leadership does not seek after that stuff. You you do it because you do want to do your duty and you want to do your duty to your God and your and your family and stuff like that. 
You don't do it because you aspire to it, that's for sure. You need to know the whys and the hows, and then consider the consequences of your choices. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. He will lead you the right way. He is your strength. You sensing a theme here, brothers and sisters? Is this guy... Is this guy bragging about how cool he is? About how much of a spiritual giant he is? His entire message is to get us to Christ. That's his whole entire message. Think about the preparation that goes into these talks. Think about the, the anxiety that goes, the butterflies that these guys must have as they address the globe. That's mind-blowing to me. That, that is mind-blowing. Um, the power of true doctrine. For the strength of youth is bold in declaring the doctrine of Jesus Christ. It is bold in inviting you to make choices based on Christ's doctrine. And it is bold in describing the blessing Jesus Christ promises those who follow his ways. President Russell and Nelson taught, When your greatest desire is to let God prevail in your life, many decisions become easier. Many issues become non-issues. You know how to best groom yourself. You know what to watch and read where to spend your time, and with whom to associate. You know what you want to accomplish. You know the kind of person you want to become. Jesus Christ has very high standards for his followers, and the invitation to earnestly seek his will and live by his truths is the highest standard possible. Important temporal and spiritual choices should not only be based on personal preference or what is convenient or popular, the Lord is not saying, do whatever you want. He is saying, let God prevail. He is saying, come follow me. He is saying, live in a holier, higher, more mature way. He is saying, keep my commandments. Jesus Christ is our perfect example, and we strive with all the energy of our soul to follow him. Okay, let, let me pause here. No, let me pause, because... This is another one of those moments, brothers and sisters, that you could just pass by. You could just pass it by. In the spirit of, of the foundation, I want to read something to you again, a little piece of that sentence. Okay? Elder Uchtdorf says, The Lord is not saying, Do it every, whatever you want. He is saying, let God prevail. Pause. When did the Lord specifically come out and say, let God prevail? Think about that. That came through his mouthpiece, didn't it? That came through President Russell M. Nelson. Come follow me. Okay. Notice that Elder Uchtdorf is not giving credit to President Nelson for these. Did, are you catching that? He's giving credit to the Lord. That is not a throwaway um, instance, right? These are these instances. They, these are things that you should take note of and mark and write some thoughts down on that because that's huge especially in the time that we're living in. Jesus Christ is our perfect example, and we strive with all the energy of our soul to follow him. My dear friends, let me repeat, if the Savior were standing here today, he would express his endless love for you, his complete confidence in you. He would tell you that you can do this. You can build a joyful, happy life because Jesus Christ is your strength. You can find confidence, peace, safety, happiness, and belonging now and eternally, because you will find all of it in Jesus Christ, in his gospel, and in his church. Of this I bear my solemn witness as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and leave you my heartfelt blessing in deep gratitude and love for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope that... I hope that these 
deep dives into these um, talks. I hope you're doing them. I hope you're doing them. If you are not in a position to take the notes, I hope you're at least listening to them and you're you're just taking as many mental notes as you can and as I do my deep dive that at least hopefully that there's some thought provoking stuff here that that as we go through and we compare notes and as you listen and as you open yourself up to the promptings of the spirit that it is a betterment to you and that it is a Something that is creating a situation that will strengthen your testimony in Jesus Christ, in the foundation of prophets and apostles, and that you are preparing yourself spiritually to be able to withstand the, the adversary and the, the many diverse sins that he will throw and temptations in your path. I love you guys. I have listeners all over the world, and whether you are Russian, whether you are Ukrainian, whether you are Belgian, whether you are Egyptian, what, what, I'm naming countries that I've seen you know, people listening from. Australian, Canadian, whatever. I will not hate any of you guys based on your location or what nationality you were born as. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I hope that nobody is judging me off of my government. <laughs> you know? And I'm not going to do the same to anybody else. I, I look forward to the time when we will all kneel together, hand in hand, arm in arm, and that as we bow our heads to the earth, to the earth itself, and as our tongues confess together, as our mouths confess together, that Jesus Christ is the King of this world, that He is the Holy Messiah promised by Isaiah and the rest of the ancient prophets, as well as the modern prophets, as we confess that together, and as we become one together, as we shrug off these these things that these geographical you know locations and things that that separate us, that we will be family, that we will truly be family, and that we will be fellow citizens in the household of God. That we will truly be saints and that we will also at some future time be ready and be the people that are able to receive him at, that, at, at his coming and that we are able to redeem Zion. I love you guys and I hope and pray for your spiritual and temporal well-being as we go into some pretty crazy times. And I... Say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.